It's April Fool's Day, and while some on this platform will take part in some hopefully good-natured shenanigans, I for one am well aware that some people don't like those. After all, those shenanigans can be evil and cruel. So, for as long as I'm going to do videos, I promise I will not do any April Fool's Day shenanigans. I swear to God I'll pistol whip the next guy that says shenanigans. <clears throat> Instead, what I plan on doing on any April Fool's Day is to try out something a little different. Not necessarily a complete format change, like best alt-rock music or the best Nintendo Wii app soundtracks. Now instead we're going to try some things just a little different. Today we're going to try to look at choices made in the name of art in a segment tentatively titled Choices Were Made. Today's journey takes us to the summer of 2020. The world has been paralyzed by SARS-CoV-2, better known as COVID-19. And while the US is fighting itself on how to deal with the new virus, Europe has not only flattened the curve, but worked its butt off to make sure the virus is near non-existent. It's a moment worth celebrating, though cautiously. Live events are about to return, though with some modifications. For sports, which sees most of its money come from advertising and television, it's not a huge deal. For theater? It becomes a bit more complicated. How exactly do you host a performance while trying to keep everyone safe? This problem went all the way to the top, as then German Chancellor Angela Merkel challenged her state's governments to try to find a way to reopen theater post-lockdown. And Land Hessen, home of the Weisbaden State Theater, was one of the first to try. The audience was greatly reduced, seating up to 150 in a house built for over a thousand. Massive orchestras trimmed to chamber ensembles at most and no chorus, just the principal characters. For example, when the theater debuted its pandemic staging of Tristan and Isolde, there was piano and violin, staging that kept everyone apart, and five soloists. Five. Tristan, Isolde, Bangane, Kervenal, Mark, Melot. I guess Kervenal and Melot doubled. Would have been interesting to see, but there doesn't seem to be any footage of it. Instead, the earliest known recording of post-pandemic opera, as far as I can find, seems to be a performance of La Traviata in Madrid, staged in July 2020 and streamed through Opera Vision. Unfortunately, due to licensing, it's no longer available, but I was able to record it while it was still up. Choosing La Traviata certainly seems like a bold choice, since it has nine named parts as well as a decent-sized chorus. How exactly do they handle this? by spacing chorus members by about one and a half meters, giving each singer four square meters of space, and breaking up the set into six distinguishable sections. Oh. The, um, the inner sound guy in me is freaking out right now. Want to see a professional chorus look foolish? <laughs> oh! Uncanny Valley. Forget bold, that was a presentation of hubris. A theater trying to thumb its nose at a virus only to do so to the mirror. Anyone with even a layman's knowledge of sound physics knows that this wouldn't have worked. Whenever you try spacing people out, you gotta compensate in some way, whether by arcing people around, or by having those all the way in the back anticipate so that they can line up with those in the front. That did not happen. Something like this worked better in Fedora for a couple of reasons. The key reason, though, was that there were only three people, two of which were front and center next to each other. As long as everyone is consistent, it works beautifully. Here you have, just gonna take an educated guess, about four dozen singers spread out across the entire stage. Even in the best case scenario, something will go wrong. Now, there were points where it did sound okay, but it usually involved the chorus being quiet, so you couldn't hear the delay coming from those in the back. There are also points where the time wasn't necessarily as strict in the orchestra, which allowed the chorus and the orchestra to actually line up together. Plus the middle of act two when the chorus reappears sounds mostly fine as parts are grouped together. 
basically the opening party song was bad and the finale of act two was off but the part after the brindisi as well as the gypsy girl song was fine enough the funny thing about this that six foot distance that we kept telling everyone to follow that means nothing when it comes to professional singing that six foot distance is only for normal breathing when you start adding in heavier breathing, like if you're doing athletics or if you're singing or, perf or performing with an instrument, that distance starts going up. For opera singers, you have to space them out as much as 25 feet, which means this staging was utterly pointless. The only people safe on stage were those in the back, which means we ruined deliberately great performances by our leads for no reason. Seriously, in spite of the situation, Marina, Rebecca, and Michael Fabiano were fantastic in their portrayals. I hope they were able to properly work together in a different staging. Same goes for Artur Rosinski. Perhaps it was him digging deep to bring life to a halted world, but I think this might be my favorite performance of his. Obviously, I wouldn't have scheduled this. I would have gone something more smaller in scale. But saying I wouldn't have done it is just too easy. How do you fix something like this? by taking advantage of modern technology. Let's move forward to December 2021. The Met has premiered Eurydice featuring a non-visible chorus. They are stationed on the lower levels of the Met as everything is going on and are being broadcast through speakers into the theater. This may be the way Madrid's post-lockdown La Traviata could have worked. Have most of your chorus singing in a different room while a smaller group sings on stage. There would have been issues as well in this case. Not only would you have to have both the live and the basement chorus lining up together, you would have also had to make sure that the basement chorus is not delayed by any electrical signal. Plus, I imagine the technique between the classical Verdi opera and the more modern Eurydice is different for the chorus. Not harder or more demanding necessarily, but different. It would require a different approach using the more modern tools. But I think it would be a worthwhile approach. Aside from taking a page from Weissbaden and just scrapping the large chorus altogether for something more streamlined. Well, that's the first choices were made. What'd you think? Let me know in the comments below. Also, let me know if there are other bizarre stagings that you know of that you want me to take a look at. If you liked this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up so that the algorithm can spread it to more viewers just like you. And if this is your first time and you liked what you see, be sure to hit the subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you can be notified when more videos are released. I will see you guys next time. Take care.